Question two is very similar to question one, so we're going to go through it rather quickly. Um, we have the aggregate demand equation. Here's the aggregate demand line. We have aggregate supply, short and aggregate supply. Initial, here's short and aggregate supply initial. And then potential GDP, which gives us long run aggregate supply. We have the price level. And it looks like um, I already calculate the equilibrium GDP level which is found by setting these two equations equal to each other. You set that equal to this, you solve for Y, and you get $17.627 trillion. You plug this value into demand or supply, and it looks like you get 13.1%. And I'll also give you the output gap, which is zero, because at this point, GDP equals potential. Okay, here's the curves, all the curves labeled correctly. We're going to move on down below. Well, before we do that, we'll talk about this. So we have the price level axis. We have the real GDP axis. We labeled the long run aggregate supply curve. We labeled the scenario one short run aggregate supply curve. We labeled the scenario one aggregate demand curve. We have the equilibrium for scenario one. <coughs> We have the value of the price level at the equilibrium, and we have the value of GDP at the equilibrium. I'll go ahead and erase that now, and we'll move on down here. Um, at the initial equilibrium here, real GDP is equal to potential, which is why short and aggregate supply and aggregate demand cross at long run aggregate supply. The output gap is zero, which means the unemployment rate is equal to the natural rate of unemployment. Moving on, we have this scenario two here. Suppose the government of a major oil producing nation in the region collapses. The resulting, the resulting supply shock will do what to shorten aggregate supply? Well, if the government of, ma of a major oil producing nation collapses, they're not gonna be able to produce oil, so it will decrease decrease short and aggregate supply. Let's see if that works. Hit enter. And it does work, okay? So the resulting short and aggregate supply curve is the green equation and the green graph. So let's go back up here. And I'm not gonna label everything. I'm just gonna label the new curve, the new level of GDP and the new price level. Okay, so we'll go back up here. We'll label the new curve. Okay, here's the new equilibrium. And then the equilibrium price level. This is the aggregate demand curve from scenario two. Here's the price level and real GDP. The GDP level is 15.4. Four seven at the new equilibrium, and the price level is fourteen point three seven three. Okay. So then you know, of course, this is aggregate demand one. Or sorry, I gotta fix this. This is kind of rushing through it. This is short run aggregate supply from scenario two and this is short and aggregate supply from scenario one and you could also say two because we're holding it well no sorry erase that so and this is aggregate demand from scenario one, we held a constant, so you could actually call it aggregate demand two as well. 
And this is long run aggro supply, right? From Cinderella 1 and 2. And then GDP fell. And the price level increased, right? The price level increased from this value here. Remember that? Yeah, the price level increased from the initial equilibrium to the new equilibrium. So let's go ahead and erase all that. And we'll go down here. So at the resulting equilibrium, real GDP is that value. The price level is that value. The output gap, now there's an output gap, right? Because GDP is 15.47. And potential GDP is 17.627. The unemployment rate, see we're here at this point here, right? We were here where unemployment equals the natural rate. Now we're here. Resources are being underutilized. Unemployment is high, so that means the unemployment rate is greater than the natural rate of unemployment. Okay. Um, let me get the initial and final price, or this is the initial price level. I'll copy that to Excel. So GDP was the price level was. And let's get the new price level. The price level and the GDP level now are. So GDP is now that value. And the price level is now this value. So GDP fell, right? And the price level went up because of the supply shock. Okay, so to calculate the economic growth rate, it is GDP is 15.47 in scenario two. It was 17.627 in scenario one. That difference divided by what it was in scenario one times 100 gives us negative 12.237%. So the economic growth rate is negative, right? The inflation rate is calculated by taking what the price level is in scenario two, subtracting off what it was in scenario one, and then dividing that difference by what it was. And this should be scenario two here. All right, we'll call that, we'll just bold it. This is what it is, and this is what they were, right? So the price level or the inflation rate is positive, right? This kind of inflation is called cost push inflation. Let's go ahead and hit enter and see if we get everything right up to this point. Uh, try a hyphen in there. So let's try a hyphen and hit enter. Cost push inflation. So that's cost push inflation. So. Um, Remember, short and aggregate supply is aggregate marginal cost. So when short and aggregate supply decreases, the marginal cost goes up. So an increase in the marginal cost is co pushing prices up. That's why it's called cost push inflation. Let's go ahead and calculate the actual output gap here. I'll take that over to Excel. So I got what GDP is in scenario one, and I got the potential GDP level. And so the output gap is a negative $2.157 trillion. It's negative, so let's go ahead and hit enter again. So we still got that answer right. Okay, remember in the classical model, percent change in velocity, velocity is held constant. So the uh, if velocity is held constant, what it is minus what it was, well, that's zero. So the percent change is zero. The change in money, the percent change in money according to the quantity theory of money would be the sum of these two, right? <coughs> and the sum of those two is a negative 2.59. And we hit enter to see if we got it right. And we did. Now in scenario three, what happens in scenario three? Well, <coughs> 
in scenario three, well, from scenario one to scenario two, we had that oil shock, right? Uh, country was toppled. An oil producing governments, an oil producing country's government was toppled, which reduced the amount of oil they could produce. Like when, when Libya, uh, when the Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi was killed, the country was tossed into turmoil and its production of oil suffered, which probably caused aggregate supply curves to shift because the cost of oil was now higher. So it, although it happened over in Libya, it probably had an effect on our economy and the fact that it raised the cost of energy for Americans, which is a supply shift through, you know, American companies. Okay, so in this scenario, unemployment, remember, is high. So when unemployment is high, that means there are a lot of people looking for work. And when there's a lot of people looking for work, um, that, tends, that tends to push wages down. So lower wages reduce the short and aggregate supply. So as long as unemployment remains high, as this curve shifts inward, prices are coming down in general. And unemployment is falling toward the natural rate of unemployment. When unemployment gets equal, when the unemployment rate equals or returns to, falls to the natural rate of unemployment, that means the the gap has been closed. And so we go from green to red. So when we label this, this right here is short neck, whoops. This right here, whoops. This right here is short run aggregate supply from scenario three. And this is short run aggregate supply from scenario one. Oh, I forgot the S there. Okay, we could also say that this is short run aggregate supply from scenario one, right? So we had an increase in aggregate marginal costs as a result of the, the supply shock. But then we had a decrease in wages because it caused unemployment to rise. So there really is, after the, if the, if the markets are allowed to um, work, if there's no intervention, high unemployment will lead to lower wages and soft demand for energy. So both those tend to lower the marginal cost of production, which would push short and aggregate supply back down to where it was. And so now unemployment at this point is back to the natural rate. Unemployment was high here. So although the prices went up, Although prices, the price level had gone up, the price level comes right back down, right? Over the long run. Right, so the supply shock caused price level to go up and GDP to go down, but with, with, with that triggered, when that triggered high unemployment, that put downer pressure on wages and general energy prices, which is an increase in supply or a decrease in aggregate marginal cost. So GDP goes back to what it was, right? So GDP will, although GDP fell in the short run, right? It is restored after the economy self-adjust. Okay. So entering these answers up here, because the oil crisis and above has caused unemployment rate to rise above the natural rate, because unemployment is really, really high here. This lowers wages. Neil Classical argued that this causes 
short run aggregate supply to increase. Assuming that this results in the following short run aggregate supply curve, right? We're gonna assume that this results in a short run aggregate supply curve. Let's see if we got it right. Okay, so I gotta pick a different word other than lowers. Let me get this right there. Okay, let's try, let's try this. Tens, now don't laugh, tends to push down wages. So let's try that, see if that works. And that works, so tends to push down wages Okay. So make sure for your homework that you, you label this curve, which is log and aggregate supply. This curve is aggregate demand. This is real GDP. This axis is uh, price level, PL. That's Y or real GDP. Put the numbers here and here and put the numbers here and here from the problem. So make sure you do that on your homework memo. I'm gonna go ahead and erase all that and I'm gonna move down below okay as a result of the crisis and the market's correction of it the equilibrium is now at the intersection of the red and black lines right here at this point real GDP is 17.627 trillion dollars the price level is 13.1 so we're back to scenario one so scenario three and scenario one have the same values of GDP and the price level the economic growth and inflation rates from the oil shock to the market correction of the crisis are, well, these should be zero, right? Oh, from the oil shock. So from the oil shock means from scenario two to the market's correction of the crisis, scenario three. So we're going from scenario two to scenario three. So, Scenario three is, are these values. So we'll change this to scenario three. And this is scenario two. So, so in scenario three, that right there is the GDP level in scenario three. This is the price level in scenario three. Now we gotta go back and get the same thing for scenario two. In scenario two, real GDP was 15.47 and the price level is 14.373. So in scenario two, that right there is the GDP level. And this right here is the price level. So again, this is scenario two, the green. And this is the red scenario three, right? And so from scenario two to scenario three, GDP increased. It is 17.627. It was 15.47. You divide that difference by what it was, 15.47, and you get an increase in GDP of 13.93. So down here. So this is from scenario two to scenario three. The inflation rate, well, if you go back here, the price level fell from here to here, right? So th th this percent change should be negative. So it is now in scenario three, 13.1. It was in scenario two, 14.373. Divide that difference by what it was in scenario two, 14.373 and you get an inflation rate that is negative. So we have deflation. Remember, velocity percent change is zero in the classical model, so we'll go ahead and hit okay. Okay, so the percent change in money, according to the quantity theory of money, you add these two together and you get 15.086. And we're almost done with this question.
Okay, from scenario one up here, from scenario one to scenario three, so we went from scenario one back to scenario three, rural GDP did not change. The price level, so this is over the long run, because we had a short run reduction in GDP and an increase in prices, but then over the long run, we came right back down here. So the price level did not change. From scenario one back to scenario three. Okay, we hit enter and we should get all correct answers. Um, oh, sorry. We got, we got three more answers to answer here. If the Austrian School of Economics had its way, short and supply, self-correction depicted above, can be blank due to blank being flexible. We'll call that wages, right? If so, short and supply is, okay. So let's try this again. If the Austrian School of Economics had its way, short and supply, self-correction depicted above can be quick or fast due to wages being flexible. If so, short and supplies, self-adjustment from green to red is going to be quick or fast. In the world of intervention, we have all kinds of labor market interventions like minimum wage laws, we have anti-poverty policies. When unemployment is high and there's all kinds of anti-poverty policies, people aren't gonna go back to work as quickly. Um, they're not gonna need to go back to work. So they're gonna wait until they get a job offer that equals roughly the wage they were being paid before. So people won't go back to work um, and wages tend to be sticky in that situation. So both that should be quick, this should be wages, and that should be quick. Because in the Austrian school, there is no intervention. There's no uh, welfare benefits, there's no unemployment insurance, there's no government unemployment insurance, there's no government uh, food stamps or whatnot. So people who are unemployed have no choice but to go back to work at lower wages. So now we hit enter and we do get all the answers correct.